Welcome to this small extension to our Sunday Science Cosmic Shambles question and answer sessions. Now a question came up about milk froth and you know Trent suggested I cover it in a question and I thought I might as well do a demo and if I was going to do a demo I might as well make some measurements and if I was going to make some measurements I might as well do them at least semi properly and if I was going to do that I might as well make a video so you can see what I did. So that is what this is and milk froth you know why, is it, why does anyone care about that? Well, I care about it because I drink hot chocolate and I, not, I'm not a coffee drinker, but I think coffee drinkers uh, care about it too. But there's a question about how much froth you get from different types of milk. And the world of milk used to be a lot simpler, right? There were skimmed and semi-skimmed and whole milk. And now there are lots of plant-based milks, oat milk, almond, soy, and so on. And those are mostly what I drink. I haven't, I haven't drank cow's milk for years. And so I have written about the science of foaming which is what we're talking about in the dairy milks there's lots of solid science on that and i've never seen anything about these non-dairy milks and so i thought it would be really interesting first of all to test out the theory that i have written about actually when it comes to what causes foam in milk but i've never tested it and also to compare the results with the non-dairy milks just to see how they perform so very briefly here is the the theory of what it takes to form a foam in a milk. The first thing is you need some milk and you need to get air into it. That's the easy bit. That's pretty much the same whichever milk you use. What happens next is that bubbles, that air breaks up into bubbles. Now in order for a bubble to last it needs to be coated and possibly also small. Small bubbles last a lot better. Now that coating, that, that's what keeps your bubble safe. If it's got a strong coating it will stay in the milk and you'll generate foam. If, if it's weak then it'll just rise to the surface and burst. So when it comes to dairy milks, this is what the textbooks say. There are two things in milk which can make that coating and protect a bubble. One of them is protein capsules and the other one is fat globules. So what's supposed to happen, according to all the textbooks, is that you start with cold milk, you make a foam out of that, and when it's cold milk, the protein capsules form the little cages around the bubbles and you've got a nice foam. But if you keep heating it up, what happens is that those fat globules, which are little specks of solid fat, they start to melt. And as they start to melt, they mess about with this protein coating. They break it up. So warm milk is supposed to be not so good for generating these cages. And then when you heat it up even more, what happens is that the fat globules melt completely. You've got liquid fat, and that is very good at making little cages for your bubbles. And so... Um, Basically, the idea is that hot and cold, you're doing all right with dairy milk. In the middle, not so good. But I've never tested this. And I'm going to do some tests. And here are the way the tests, very quickly, the tests are going to work. I've got um, glasses like this. I've got a set of them. I'm going to put 100 grams of each type of milk in the glass. I've got a little frothing device here, like this. I was given for um, my birthday once. What this is, is a, it's actually a coaster, but it's conveniently got a hole in it so they can be stacked. And I'm wandering around my living room yesterday, this was. Um, so I've worked out that if I place that coaster on top of the glass, it holds the frothy bit about a centimetre and a half above the glass. So I can hold it in exactly the same place. Do this for 20 seconds. So I've got exactly the same foaming for each glass. Um, for temp heating, I did it by putting them in the microwave for the same length of time. So come out of the fridge, four degrees, uh, heat it up for 40 seconds in the microwave, gets you to 40 degrees and uh, one minute 20, 70 seconds, gets you to 70 degrees. I've got three types of dairy milk. I've got three types of non-dairy milk. I've got a, a Sunday afternoon. Here we go. It's now quite a lot later on Sunday and I have done a lot of experiments. There were 36 in total. It took a little bit longer than I thought it would, but you know, that's the nature of experimental science. And one of the things that gets me about being an experimentalist is that I never stop being surprised that experiments take longer than I think. But anyway, 
So here, here are, here's a summary of the results. Um, and the first thing I did was to carefully inspect the back of the packets for the quantities of protein and fat that were in there. Um, and you can see that the proteins in the first column here, and you can see that the dairy milks pretty much have the same amount of protein between 3.3 and 3.6 grams per 100 mils. And but obviously fat goes down, as you would expect to from lots, half of that and almost nothing. And then the plant based milks were a lot more variable. So oats kind of sits in the middle on, on both ranges. The oat barista has a lot less protein, but quite a lot of fat. Almost, almost as much, but not quite as much as the whole milk. And the almond almost has very little of either, really. So what did we see in these measurements? Well, here are the photographs for the dairy milks. It's easier to compare them separately because the dairy ones, you know, there's a nice, easy series. So you can see, first of all, so these are the pictures after they were frothed. And you can see that the top, we've got the lowest temperatures, the cold ones at the top here, four degrees C, and there is much more volume up at the top than there is down below as we go to 40 and 70 degrees C. There isn't very much difference going across to the eye as we go from whole to semi-skimmed to skimmed. Now let's look at the non-dairy milks. So this is quite a different picture. They didn't they didn't froth up nearly as much at the cold temperatures. There's just this one here, which is, oops, almond milk at 40 degrees. And that one, gen that generated a lot of a lot of froth. The others are fairly similar. Um, but the one thing which we will pick up on in a bit is that the one thing that's different about these is you can see that all of them, uh, that all of the non-barista ones have separated into two layers. So they've got, I guess, a watery layer underneath and the foam sits on top of that. The barista one doesn't do that as much. Whereas if we look at the dairy milks, there's all, we can't see any layers. It's the same all the way through. So let's look at the measurements here. And here on this plot, we've got, this is just the dairy milks. We've got temperature going along the bottom. Now there's only three points, but I've put a line on them so it's easier to see the trend. And then the percentage change in density up the side. So you can see that cold whole milk increased by two thirds, increased its volume by two thirds, just with 20 seconds of frothing, which I thought was quite impressive. Um, so basically the whole milk, the patterns here are that the whole milk made more froth in all three, te all three temperatures and then semi-skimmed and then skimmed. I think this little bit here is probably within the error bars, but I'm not completely certain, might be real. Um, and that generally colder milk made far more froth than the warmer temperatures. So the, the picture for dairy milk is quite simple. And then here are the non-dairy milks. We've got the two in red are the oat and the oat barista. And you can see that basically they, they kind of have a similar pattern. They're both around 25 to 30 percent, 25 to 35 increase in volume at very cold and very hot, and both of them drop in the middle. And then the blue one here is the almond, which is the weird one. I didn't expect this. You could see it on the photos where it's quite low at cold and hot, but at the warm temperatures in the middle at 40 degrees C, almond milk is suddenly making loads of foam. Um, and it, it's not entirely clear why that is, but it had, to, it had so little protein and fat in it to start with that I wasn't expecting that. So we can put them all on the same graph. Uh, and we can see, so the maximum percentage change in density is cold whole milk, but the warm almond milk is almost up there. So what have you learned from all of this? Well, does it bear out that thing about the temperature, the, the, the theory that I had written about, which is that dairy milks should be good when they're cold, good when they're hot, and not so good in the middle. So actually, my experiment can't really sort that out. And the reason is that when I went back and looked at those papers, what they talk about are stable bubbles, ones that hang around for a long time. Now, all of these foams, in because I videoed all of them, they all lasted at least a minute or two, and actually most of them much, much longer. So I think they were all pretty stable. But what the papers that we're talking about milk foam are after is the feel on your tongue. And where that comes from is having tiny bubbles that are spread throughout the liquid. So I suspect that the amount of froth isn't something anyone has ever cared very much about. What they've cared about is the feel of the bubbles. And if you have lots of small bubbles, they'll feel creamy. And so I think that is also what the barista milk is doing. So if we look at the barista oat milk, we'll look at a picture of it here. We can see that 
the hot oat milk here has separated into two layers. It's got the watery bit, which probably feels quite a lot like unfrothed milk, and then a foamy layer on top. But if we look at the barista milk, the layers are much, much weaker. There is a little layer, but it's, it's much, much harder to tell it's there. And it's also much paler. And I think that means it's got tiny bubbles dispersed throughout it. So it seems that the benefit of the barista oat milk is not to make more foam, but it's to make smaller bubbles that feel nicer. So it's nothing to do with how much froth there is. It's all, it's basically quality over quantity. Um, so it's quite interesting. I, I, I'm I impressed at the differences. You know, they're going from making a difference, you know, foam only becoming, you know, an increase in, in volume of 20% to an increase of almost 70%. So there is a massive difference that's being caused by the different, um, components of the milk. It's quite frustrating not to be able to pick apart the different bits. I think that the the plant milks are obviously designed, right? They are designed to do a job of replacing milk. It's not as simple as just protein or just fat as it is for the dairy milks because there are other things that go into them. People have thought about how to balance these components, how they behave. The one thing I do think from this is that I will bother buying barista milk and I didn't normally, but I do like creamy hot chocolate and I've remembered my little milk frother exists so I can make nice frothed hot chocolate. So I am going to bother buying barista milk. I would really like to see some good studies in the literature because I couldn't find any on um, plant-based milks and their frothing. Uh, I'm sure someone's done it. It looks to me as though the plant-based milks all make bigger bubbles and the dairy milks, the advantage they have is that the bubbles they make are really tiny. And so it's not the number of bubbles that matters, it's the creaminess of the feel. So there we are, it's the end of Sunday. I have um, taken a lot of photographs of milk <laughs> and, and I'm quite curious, you know, this, these are limited experiments, they only measure one thing. and. I really hope someone writes some nice, clear journal articles on, on, this, on the chemistry of what's going on. But it's clear that the question of which plant-based milks make the best foam, that's not a straightforward question. There's no correlation with fat content or protein content. I checked that. It's just there's no, no correlation at all. So, yeah, so the jury is out. Basically, it's still the one that you like that tastes best. So that's it from my Sunday afternoon experiment. Do join us next Sunday on the Cosmic Shambles question and answer then. And uh, until I see you again, goodbye.